Thank you, everyone. Oh, sorry. I always say thank you. I don't know why. Welcome, everyone, to the, I think this is the sixth now interview of, you know, the series of the Artists in Conversation. Um, I have a special guest today. Um, I'm really excited to speak with her. First of all, she's a Sotheby's alum like me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. Um, <laughs> and also her, her artwork package game is just on a billion. <laughs> Um, like I've never seen anything like it. Um, so you. I'd like to welcome Emily Horderman to the stage and Thank welcome you. her to the Zoom and to talk about her amazing works. I'm so excited about having her works in the show and getting a chance to work with her. It's just been a really, 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 really rewarding experience. So welcome, Emily. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for including me. Uh, I'm I'm excited. I've I was you know super excited you know when I first saw your work and just you know, the opportunity to learn about the process and, you know, just to dig deeper and understand, you know, what contains, you know, what's contained in the work, um, the subjects and because, you know, the titles, they, when I was going over for the publication, I just would laugh every time I would see them. And, you know, and then I started to be like, man, you know, like, you know, reading, it starts to take on a different, you know, meaning and toll. And it's like, wow, okay. You know, and then once you're installing them and you get to look at them face to face, it starts to take on different meanings. So I guess one of my first questions, you know, to you as, you know, an artist is, how do you get started in your process when deciding when you want to tackle a subject? Yeah, I think, um, I think when I first get started, it's, it's, I find something unique or interesting, or like something I want to kind of delve deeper into, like, for example, the pieces that are relating to um, auction sales, the, the text pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I started doing research on uh, the pink tax originally, and it kind of sent me down a rabbit hole of like, um, you know, feminine care products as luxury goods. And then I started thinking of luxury goods and auction house, and I started wanting to um, research about the sale of uh, uh, female uh, women identifying artists um, um, and their uh, auction their auction records and so this whole series came out of some pretty intense research on on the art market and um, and uh, appropriating artworks um, from auction catalogs um, and then the other works that I have included my uh, more analog collages of um, of magazines and cookbooks and that sort of thing kind of comes from kind of personal exploration, um, taking items from like my family lineage. And I had all of these um, things from my great grandmother and my grandmother and I started assembling them in a way just to kind of work through um, a personal experience of what femininity is mm -hmm. so it comes from a lot of just research and processing um <laughs> no yeah like it's it's really interesting and one of the questions i have like with the research and you know, processing is how did sotheby's you know affect you know the research a as an artist because i know me coming going to the school you know, as a gallerist, you know, and a dealer on that side, I got to really understand some things that I, you know, I guess it was more language based um, mm -hmm. to understand how the markets work, how, uh, you know, how, what's the fiduciary duty of a gallerist to an artist, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. But as mm -hmm. an artist, how did, you know, going to a school that's focused on the business side really help you look at your practice? Yeah, I mean, I, so my background's in painting and photography, um, but through like internships and working, I realized that a lot of, of my gift is kind of organization. And I thought, well, you know, how wonderful would it be to start, you know, looking more at the side of the art world that needs that skill. And so um, I was looking into programs that could kind of lead me to um, maybe a museum or a private collection, um, kind of managing more of the organizational side of things. And so that's what kind of led me to Sotheby's. And I went into the contemporary art program um, 
And it was interesting because I wasn't making a ton of work during the program. As you know, it's very intense that, that full year. It's very intense, a lot of um, reading, networking, uh, projects, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it led me to working in a private collection. Um, and they had like stacks of auction catalogs. And it was uh, just interesting to go from you know, learning from an auction house, how the process works, and then going into a private collection and collecting works from that side um, for the collection. And um, seeing these stacks of auction catalogs, just like, just growing in my apartment. Um, and I started cutting stuff out. And I was like, this is like, I'd like to collage with this. I want to like use this for something. And that kind of sparked my my practice again to like start working a lot um, mm -hmm. and I started making these text pieces using auction catalog pieces and obviously with the auction catalog or with the auction works I'm appropriating from the um from the auction sales itself so it's kind of like a manifestation of these little works that I was creating in my New York apartment mm -hmm. um and I still have a ton of those pieces. And you can see in the um, colorful collages that uh, I'm also incorporating those auction catalogs again. So it's funny that this kind of this uh, where I started at Sotheby's like it kind of has followed me all through my practice because I keep it's like a touchstone for me using um, using these auction catalogs. It's like history. Yeah, it's 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 really cool because like and and now it speaks to you know the packing expertise and everything like that because now having to go to you know uh, you know private collections and things like that you have mm -hmm. to make sure that pieces are secure and you know ready to go and you know if anything I could you know tell artists is that you know if, if Emily is ever doing a, a how to pack your art class be sure to take it because any curator or gallerist would be happy happy to receive your works in the way that we did <laughs> uh, it just made it so much easier so you can you can see you know the that that time and that care and that understanding of the you know, the practice of protecting artworks um how how that translated to your own practice so that was that was really amazing um that's awesome <laughs> but yeah it was it was dope um but yeah so let's 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 get into the works um i want to yeah. start with the i guess the less collaged works the the i call them the twos you know the he's a two yeah. the she's a two so i always call them yeah. the twos um what's the history of those and how did how did you come up with the concept of these i see like i always see the background of andy you know and then everything in the uh i couldn't make out what's in the background of uh the joan one but um yeah so that is uh that is a portion of her highest selling piece um, mm. called Blueberry. Mm. Um, and obviously, you know, I wanted to use um, just like a, a portion of the work uh, for appropriation reasons, but also um, to just kind of do a breakdown of the palette. I'm very interested in the palettes that artists use and like, um, and the color choices. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, a big part of it was just to have a sense of what the palette of that painting was. So I chose a very specific section of it to, to kind of blow up. Um, but what's interesting is for her, I chose her top selling work um, to, uh, to date to use. But for Andy, uh, I didn't wanna use this top selling work because it didn't actually have a lot of color in it. Mm -hmm. um, so I went with one of his bright wig paintings. Um, and what's interesting is that particular painting is worth double than Joan's highest selling, Joan Mitchell's highest selling piece. So it's a, another comment on um, kind of the imbalance of, mm -hmm. of sales of, of female artists. Um, so basically what I did uh, was I started with kind of like pink tax research um, and the luxury good um, inquiry into the the auction sales. And so what I found was some ArtNet data um, from a 10 year period that uh, showed that this, the sales of female artists for that 10 year period was about 2% of the total sales, mm -hmm. uh, auction sales um, 
which is like less than the total sales of uh, Picasso's output, like this 2%. Yeah. Cause um, I know Warhol's like 7% of the market himself. It's insane. It's yeah. crazy. And then, so, so I broke it down for this particular series in the top five uh, male and the top five female um, artists from that list. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as the, the, the world is, has, has changed in the last couple of years with really, um, really focusing on kind of the um, injustices and the uh, uh, identifiers and you know who we are and this obviously is very limited data which is from you know artnet and um it was passed it was like 2008 to 2018 so we're looking mm -hmm. at very a very niche specific um thing that they they researched i want to just put that out there that it's you know it's i'm translating the data that um that they have so top five male and top five female and I can go ahead and tell you what those are. Yeah, let's that do it. It was, uh, it was uh, Kusama, mm -hmm. uh, Mitchell, mm -hmm. Louise Bourgeois, mm -hmm. Georgia O'Keeffe, and Agnes Martin. Mm. And then your male, you've got your Picasso, your Warhol. And then there was um, two uh, Asian artists that I actually had, hadn't heard of before. Was it Ji uh, um, Ji? Uh, Zhang Dequin, D A Q I A N. Hmm, I haven't heard of him. And then Kibashi. Oh, Kibashi. Yeah, Kibashi is. Bashi, dope. Okay. Great. Yeah, Kibashi yeah. is very, very, very dope. Very I mean, dope. It was so interesting to, to, to dive into this because I was like, what? I'm like, you know, I'm learning something here. I, yeah. I had no idea. And then Monet. So you've got <laughs> like those. Are, and that's what I've got the Monet one up here behind me. So there's another example you know um and so what i did was i knew i wanted to create something with the works with their works and i knew i wanted to do something text-based i use a lot of text in my work um i was very interested in analyzing handwriting in a previous life like i'm very interested in in words and art mm -hmm. and i knew i wanted to use text somehow um, and I started looking at um, the lot essays that went along with the pieces and realized that, um, interestingly, that usually when it went to a male artist, it used really strong words, mm -hmm. um, genius, you know, uh, famous, sensational, like, you know, masterwork. Mm -hmm. And then for women, the they mostly used words like um like fragile or delicate mm -hmm. um and so i started collecting all of these kind of words that describe either the artist or their 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 output um and wrote them all down and so the words the text that's used for each artist is something from their law essay um wow. about the work it, it just it takes it so much you know deeper um mm -hmm. you know now that you you know breaking it broken it down in in those you know terms and facets and you know giving me the groundwork for it it's like is there any any reason for the color uh of the actual text you know with gold and blue is that just an aesthetic thing or is that does that have many meaning um i tried to use something that would um contrast mm -hmm. um for jones it was very uh, specific that I chose kind of that blueberry color that came from the painting itself. I wanted to match kind of another, the, you know, contrasting color that was in it. For mm -hmm. Warhol, it was more about, you know, acknowledging kind of like gold Maryland or kind of the glitziness of him. Um, for some of the others, it was more about just creating enough contrast to see the text. Mm -hmm. um, and then for some of them I chose, or in my kind of initial creation of these pieces, I kind of wanted to have a mix of works that included pink a lot, mm -hmm. because I wanted to price them in a way that acknowledged pink tax. Wow. Um, and that was kind of like an earlier iteration of like the thought process behind it. but. So there are, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of pieces that just uh, have pink text that it's not exactly related to the work itself, the, or the, the work that it was, the, it was um, appropriated from.
Wow. Yeah, these pieces, <laughs> they they stick out so much more, you know, you know, with the, you know, because for me, I got I got a chance, especially with the video that, you know, is along with the exhibition, a mm -hmm. chance to see how they were made, you know, mm -hmm. and that was amazingly cool because seeing the process of, you know, cutting and slicing and, you know, really, really, you know, fine tuning. Um, but, you know, getting to hear the, the background of how, you know, it started from, you know, the private collections and then from the auction houses and things like that, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it adds more depth, you know, to the works. And I think a lot of viewers, especially when they go to exhibitions, they don't get a chance, you mm -hmm. know, well, the artist really doesn't get a chance to explain, you know, the way like they want to, you know, to, to allow people to get it. Because if, if you did, you'd be speaking all night and you would never move, you know, so it was, you know, it's kind of tough. And, you know, that's why I love doing these talks for, you know, folks to, you know, allow them to dive a little bit deeper and understand what they're looking at, you know, either yeah. they've gone to the show and want, you know, a little review of understanding like, man, you know, Emily's work was really cool. I would love to learn a little bit more about, you know, the, the, the two pieces. Um, mm -hmm. And they're able to get that, you know, and, or able to have a preview of it before they go um, mm -hmm. and go excited, you know, to see them and to have that information you know, about them and get there and tell their friends, you know, so mm -hmm. they can seem smart and educated about Emily, you know, and her work. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, so for the, the next collage series, which I really, really enjoy, I was, you know, reading, you know, a lot of the stuff like the cooking for baby, you know, when I was installing it, like, um, you know, uh, it really, these really reminded me of uh, an artist. Uh, I don't know if you know him, his name is Daniel Ortega. Um, but he's been, he, I, I've seen his work out in London and his work has, you know, to do a little bit with machinery um, okay. and kind of like the instructions on how to put together machinery ah. in a sense. So like when I saw, you know, what to do with the left hand, it immediately mm. kind of like reminded me of those type of works. What are the basis of these works? Where do these come from? Where, where does the series stem from? So uh, I've been kind of making these kind of smaller analog collages using magazines. They started out kind of like, as, um, I called them my women's studies. Mm -hmm. It was like um, deconstructing fashion magazines, kind of pairing it with the auction catalog pieces, that sort of thing. Um, and then my, my mom started sending me these kind of things from my great grandmother and my grandmother um sewing items the the string that I use mm -hmm. um cookbooks that like my my great grandmother like you know hand wrote in um and these kind of like old photos and like this like kind of like old photo book that like my grandma had wow. and just, like I was just like this stuff is awesome what am I supposed to do with it like I want to make something with it it was just you know so inspiring um and I started cutting stuff out um, and kind of putting them together. And I was like, this could be a really great series kind of exploring this kind of history of um, this kind of like nostalgic history of like, you know, the, the woman's role or something like that. Like I, there's something, there's a whole story I like to tell a lot that um, before I moved to New York, I was, um, I was 26 and my grandmother um, on her deathbed was like, you need to just get married. <laughs> and like, you're going to be an old maid. Aww. And that story kind of stuck with me as like, uh, you know, I was wanting to go out and like do this thing, get my master's, do all this stuff. But like, she was very concerned that I wasn't like prescribing to this, like this thing that's just, you know, each generation that, you know, my, that you like are supposed to do or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so I'm kind of working through that, mm -hmm. exactly that, like looking at this kind of like, this like nostalgic idea of, you know, specifically like this one for the baby, 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 with this idea of like cooking for baby, this couple that's looking down, which actually is an ad from um, a record player company. <laughs> Um, and then this like kind of old, this like 1970s Barbie coloring book and like, just like these little kind of artifacts of like a past time. Mm -hmm. And I think 
um, that really speaks to kind of the moment we're in. There's like this, you know, this idea of like going back to something that like maybe wasn't that great in the first place, you know? <laughs> so it's like kind of working through that. Um, but then also kind of acknowledging kind of like art history. So you've got this other piece, this no one respects you for your oversized mouth um, that comes from, there's like a little clipping that I found in like a notebook that my grandma had. Yeah. And it's this insane article that's like, you know, get it together. Like you need to be the woman in the house and like you married your husband and like be a good wife. Yeah. Um, wow. But then kind of using these old pieces to create this kind of like Baldessari-esque, you know, with these guys sitting playing cards, covering their faces or like kind of the idea of the, of Kusama's, um, you know, spots, um, just kind of playing a little bit with the two things. Yeah. Like with me, like one thing that captures, you know, my attention about them is, you know, the bold background colors, you know, <laughs> they, they are, you know, very defining and, I, I, I when installing them, I was look, I was, you know, saying to myself, like, you could literally put a title across the top and these could be magazine covers, you know, <laughs> with, with the right, you know, different, uh, you know, with the titling of the contents that are going to be inside and everything mm -hmm. that goes with making that publication. And these could be, you know, the covers of magazines to where they're, you know, talking about, you know, different topics. Um, and I was like, wow, you know, I, one day, if, you know, Emily ever did a book, you know, with these in it, you know, behind them, you know, the story about them, you know, would be mm -hmm. really cool, you know, to understand what's going on. And, you know, like we're talking about now, um, and it just really took me to uh, almost like Saturday morning cartoonish, you know, <laughs> in, a, in a sense, um, because, that. you know, I, I grew up, you know, 80s, 90s, and you know, I guess it was kind of like that transition from VHS, UHF, you know, to what we know now. Yeah. Uh, back yeah. when TV, I guess, at some points, you know, used to really go off. <laughs> People, you know, still talk about that. Like, I, I remember, you know, 11, 12 o'clock, you know, I remember it used to just be nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know, but, you know, now TV never goes off, you yeah. know, so I guess you know, that was a generation that, you know, I really didn't know I was a, a super kid, you know, young, young, but yeah. you know, it's still memorable um, and bringing back that nostalgic feeling mm -hmm. of, you know, I remember going to, you know, Chuck E. Cheese as a kid or something like that, or watching, you know, different cartoons and having, you know, like the, the character from like the Barbie thing, it reminds me for some reason of the, of not Velma, what's the other girl from Scooby-Doo? Um, the cheerleader. Oh my gosh. I know you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. it, 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 it yes. throws me in that mode um, yeah, yeah, to yeah. where it still has <laughs> a, a playful mystery, you know, mm -hmm. everything about it. And it just, it, it really, it lends itself to that. And I, and I really, I really enjoyed, you know, just visually walking by them, you know, after they were installed and just like, you know, catching a glimpse and, you know, taking yeah. little, little reads of a line or, you know, seeing like the image like, oh, okay, I didn't recognize this in an image before, because mm -hmm. each time you pass it, you get a different uh, feeling, something else catches you mm -hmm. um, to where it becomes the, the center of the painting. You know what I mean? Like, or of the yeah. piece. Um, mm -hmm. One second, it could be, you know, like the, the the man and woman looking down at the record player. And then the next moment mm -hmm. you can notice the cuss. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, and mm -hmm. that could be exactly where your eyes go or, you know, not realizing that, you know, that's an upside down pack of cigarettes. You yeah. know, and what does that mean? You know, did she hide it because she didn't want to show tobacco or whatever? Like, mm -hmm. you know, and just... You know those rhetorical questions start to come to mind um you know and seeing things upside down and you know having that feeling of you know what's happening here even the you know the the contrast of the tinted paper and the white paper like i think mm -hmm. that is you know a, a a real subtle but edgy part of abstraction you know mm -hmm. and seeing how it just lays off the side of the paper you know those little things for me you know looking at I works, I, I find those things to where it's like, okay, you know, I mean, as a curator, you know, in the gallerist, you, 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 you live with these things, 
you know, mm -hmm. not just things, these artwork, but these these things in your head to where it's like every time you pass that piece, you kind of get a new a, a new talking point because you discover something yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's like like wow, okay, when when someone comes up, it's easy for you to explain what you like about it, you know, and it's you know in turn for tells them like hey, you know. I can't tell you exactly what the artist was feeling, but this is what I feel about it. When I see it, you see this little piece here, this is what really gets me. And then you start to not necessarily train people, but you encourage people to see for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And they start to slow walk the work and then find different things that excite them. And then they become like, wow, you know, this piece really stands out and you see them engage more with the exhibition. So mm -hmm. I really, really enjoy these um, talks and you know background histories per se on the works because it really does do something for the viewer and it it, it adds you know a participation factor you know mm -hmm. and, and allowing them to see you know how you create you know it you know it sometimes it gives the people the feeling of like okay I could do that too but it's like no nah, maybe you can maybe you can't you know there's you know there's some time behind this but that 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 welcome feeling of you know I can be an artist too I can do this with regular materials it's it's really rewarding for you know visitors to see you know and allows them to you know feel like they can be a part of this art world as well um right. so wonderful yeah 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 so any last words for the viewers out here that's you know want to see more of the dopeness because you know the show is still on and everybody that's visiting LA for freeze and all the good artworks the show is on view uh just got a nice mention in the LA times which Yay! is awesome um, <laughs> so go check it out you can see amazing works by Emily and so many other talented artists um super excited to uh work with all of these artists um and just honored that they were allowing me to be a custodian for a second of their works and allow me to uh, extend the experience outside of their studios to you all. So I want to thank Emily and um, yeah, give her the floor to let, tell, let her tell you guys some awesome before she has to go do her dope stuff for the day. No, thank you. Thank you so much again for including me in this. I think uh... for me, the process of it is always just as important as the final piece. And it makes me really happy that you picked up on kind of like the idea of the graphic design. My mom is a graphic designer. So it's like deep in my body of like who I am. Um, yeah, I'm just honored to be, be a part of this group and part of this exhibition and to get to know you. Yes, Thank you. most definitely. It's been awesome. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just the start of more cool stuff because I promise you some more stuff is coming. Amazing. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in and be sure to check out the exhibition and be sure to follow Emily and all the great stuff she is doing. Um, and we will check you in a bit. Thank awesome. you, Emily. And thank you all so thank much. Thank you. Bye.